Yeah, so um, and just first of all, welcome to St. Stephen's University. For those of you who this might be the first time, this is the Red Room, uh, the, the scene of lots of great uh, activities and lectures over the years. Um, we just warmly welcome you and hope that you feel free to come back anytime. We do have, in terms of the lecture series, some little white sheets as Rosie is holding up if you want to have a reminder for the future lectures. Um, this is the third, as I said, in the series. Freda and Leslie were here the first week um, and talked about the residential schools and, and medicine and healing. Uh, last week, um, the Honorable Graydon Nicholas was with us and he talked about his faith journey and, and how he reconciles his Christian faith with um, Native spirituality. It was wonderful. And he did a lovely promotion for this week. Um, so everyone's very much looking forward uh, to being here. And uh, just by way of introduction, it, this is David and Imelda Purley, and they, they live in Fredericton, I believe, uh, and they're at the um, Mi'kmaq Willis Way Center mm -hmm. of UMB. Um, I had a chance to meet them last spring when I had a class on uh, politics of advocacy. We met with them at the uh, Kingsclear First Nations mm -hmm. um, Community Center, and I uh, had a wonderful morning with them. <coughs> Uh, David is the director of the center um, and has all kinds of experience in, in uh, Aboriginal studies and um, Aboriginal culture and language, maybe not language, yes. <laughs> uh, and Imelda has just been named the elder in residence for UNB and is the the uh, sweat lodge keeper and medicine wheel keeper and sacred pipe keeper, and so um, involved with all kinds of the um, Aboriginal spirituality and uh, rituals and ceremonies. So um, I just want to very warmly welcome you um, here and thank you so much for for coming for sharing your wisdom. Uh, the title of this evening's uh, session is Circle of Understanding, and so we're looking forward to, to both of you. So, welcome. Welcome. So, I'm just yeah. going to turn it over to you, and do you want me to put that into yes, the yes. magic machine? Yes. Thank you for uh, inviting us to uh, share, with, share with you this, this evening. Um, we always appreciate an opportunity to, to uh, promote Mi'kmaq, Lost Away, Pastor Body, Penobscot cultures, histories, worldviews, um, ceremonies, traditions, and so on. Um, it's, it's, for me at least anyway, I think it's a, uh, there's a, a wonderful change happening within the Resic society where more people, more university citizens would like to see and hear about traditions and ceremonies and also the histories. You know, um, when you look at the history of the Mi'kmaq, Lestaway people, past the bodies as well, um, they made some very important contributions to the history of New Brunswick, but we never hear about them. We never, in the public school system, when I was going through a system a few years ago, um, we never hear about contributions of Mi'kmaq, Lost Away, Pacified people in the history of New Brunswick. So, so now, the education system, I was with the education system for 15 years, and my objective has always been to ensure that when, when students graduate from high school, um, they should know something about our histories as well. You know, we, have, you know, we hear about the Anglophone history. We hear about the Francophone history. But we haven't heard about Mi'kmaq, Lost Away, and Passapodius. So it's always been my objective, my priority, to ensure that within the curriculum of the, the Brunswick Public School system, we would have that knowledge, that information, so that, so that our students will, have, will be well informed in terms of our First Nations people here in New Brunswick. So I, I want to thank you for inviting us. And the way we'll do this this evening is um, <coughs> Melody will start. She's, she's going to share ceremonies. And then after <coughs> you know that shared information about ceremonies, then I'll give you a very brief overview of the history of the last week and the Mi'kmaq as well as Pacific people. So, so you're on. 
I just wanted to uh, start off with the traditional, my traditional name, uh, my grandmother. It's a name that my grandmother had gifted me, and of course it was outlawed in school because nobody could pronounce it or nobody mm -hmm. wanted to know what it meant, which was a blossom was. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'd forgotten about that, uh, even though it was, uh, she would address me a blossom was, you know, she would mm -hmm. tell me to do all of this with my name. But when I would go to school, that name wasn't allowed. So that's where the Imelda Mary came. Everybody in my generation uh, were all either carried the first name Mary or the middle name Mary. And the men are always Davids and Josephs and Peters and Pauls and, and all of that. <coughs> that was the influence of the Catholic Church that in our community. So our names weren't allowed. And I didn't, res I didn't think, I didn't remember my name again until I started to do a ceremony. There's a ceremony called, uh, it's called Shaken Tent Ceremony. There's an elder who has the gift of being the, the I, I guess, the messenger between the spirit world and the physical world. And so those of us who were looking for spirit names went to this particular elder. Now, I have to admit, I was a skeptic at mm -hmm. first because, you know, I've watched, um, uh, um, What's that show, uh, Dorothy and uh, Woodrow Claus? Oh. <laughs> and you know how it, this, it seemed like there was this monster, but uh, all it was was this man with a little thing. And, and that's what I was suspecting because when I went to that ceremony in Ojibwe country in um, uh, Garden, Garden River, Ontario, and uh, when I was there, I remember. My friends, there was seven of us that traveled from our territory here to go and do a ceremony, which was the intent was to fast, meaning going without food and water and, and totally sacrificing. And the reason you do that is if you sacrifice physical, then the elders believe that your spirit is, is then um, uh, fed better, you know, better than us feeding our bodies with food and water. When we deny ourselves of that, then it's to sharpen our senses and be more aware of our purpose, etc. So I went for the purpose of language. And I'll tell you why I had to go and do ceremony for my language. It's because I was brought up in my language. I was surrounded by my language. But as soon as I started school, it was starting to, English was starting to take over. And when I would go home, you know what our grandparents used to do? The priest and the the priests and the nuns and the Indian agents had gave themselves the right to come to our homes to inspect to make sure we were using English over Maliseet. Mm -hmm. So we had dogs that spoke our language and understood our language. <laughs> yes, they barked in Maliseet. <laughs> <laughs> but Every time the dog barked, it would alert us that a stranger was coming up our driveway, mm -hmm. and we would switch to English for that benefit. Then when, then when they would leave, we'd switch back. And that was very important for my grandmother to do for survival, because if she was caught speaking the language in the home, she would have been denied cords of wood for the winter. Mm -hmm. She would have been denied uh, supplies to keep the family warm with warmer blankets, because our homes didn't have insulation or any of that. So they needed those extra supplies. And so in order for her to survive, she had to support that English idea in the home, even though she didn't want it. But I remember moving away from home back in the 60s, because we were kicked out of school in Perth just because we were Maliseet. We, the parents of the day, didn't want their non-Aboriginal children dating those Maliseets from Tobik. And so the parents of the non-Aboriginal children decided to host a meeting, what they call the pay raiders meeting, and our tax pay raiders like meeting. It would be like your school board today. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and they, they voted that they didn't want Maliseet children to go to, um, to, go to uh, a school. And of course, we were taught that going to school <coughs> is a privilege, and therefore, uh, 
We didn't have a whole lot of absences when we were starting school because it was told that it's a privilege and you have to go learn. And so what ended up happening when we were told we weren't allowed to go to school, rather than saying, yay, no school, you know, it was like, why not? Mm -hmm. and, and the reason was we weren't wanted there. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening, I'm so proud of my grandparents and parents of the day, they boycotted the stores because what was happening in that time, what was happening in that time is the Indian agent opened himself up his store that sold furniture and groceries and clothing and items. So when, when money would come as, um, to the community, they would tell my grandfather, George, instead of me giving you a check, why don't I just open up a charge account for you so that you can come to me any time you want. Who was gonna keep account of what my grandfather was actually taking and what money was there? So what ended up happening is um, when our parents boycotted the stores, the community realized that they were losing out on money. And so that's when the government decided to start paying tuition on our behalf so that that school would then take us as students. But I was one of those ones that didn't want to go where I wasn't wanted. And I was only 12 years old, you know. And when that storekeeper came, and I remember him on his knees to my grandfather and saying, George, send your granddaughter back to school. You know, uh, uh, my grandfather said, don't ask me, ask her. She's the one that has to go to that school. She's the one that has to go there on a daily basis. So he came over to me on his knees and he goes, young lady, will you come back to school? And all I asked was, will I be able to use my language until I learn English better? No, no, dear. Your, your language is not going to be allowed <coughs> in the school. So I opted not to go back. And uh, uh, I ended up moving away from home. And, uh, and it was when I had moved away from home that my grandmother, because I was telling I'm going to a non-native school in New York, and I told her, I said, guess what? I learned a new word today. I like the way it sounds. It's reiterate. And I even spelled it out for her. And she'd go, she'd go, uh, Never forget your first language. That's not who you are. You may learn that language all you want, but that's not who you are. You're what the language is that we brought you up in. And what was really important was one English word she never allowed in our home is she said, I know you're going to hear this word in school, but I never want to hear it in this house. And it's H-A-T-E. I never want to hear that word in this house because I know of people who use that word and they know what it feels like. I mm -hmm. never want you to feel that mm -hmm. word. It's not a good word. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, just that limitation of knowing there's a difference between English and there's a difference between my language. And so, so that's where I'm coming from is being grounded in my language. Now, yes, I've swayed away because I wanted to be a nice, non -ab. I wanted to show that I could be just as non-Aboriginal as I possibly can, especially with my color. My brother is darker, you know, and I, could, I always wondered how come my brother was darker and I was lighter. And, uh, uh, you know, then you get to understand later on different fathers, you know, and stuff, but they weren't explained that at the time back in the 60s. And, so, you know, <laughs> so, so. and how come I was born? I thought nine months, and I was born seven months after they'd married, you know, and stuff. So those are just questions every child has and stuff. But I did find out I have a beautiful father that I kind of thought, I wish he was my father when I was a child, but those were secrets that were kept in the community. And come to find out, he was living right across the street from me growing up, and he was the most wonderful man. And I wondered how come I always felt that when he passed, I, I, I sensed the loss because I never knew my father, you know, and stuff, the one who called himself my dad. But, uh, but I did with this man, and, uh, and, and I'm, happy to, um, I'm happy that my mom, before she passed, told the truth of who my father was. And I thanked him for it. I just wished I would have known earlier because mm -hmm. that man passed away too before I went. <coughs> so the ceremonial part is important. So when I, dis when I started my linguistic degree, my own people said, don't write the language down. Because if you write the language mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. the English are gonna take it away from us, and they're gonna know it, and they're gonna take it, and it's gonna be theirs and not ours. And I <coughs> was confused by that. Mm -hmm. So I went to my elder, and my elder told me, 
I, I, why don't you go fast, ask the ancestors, mm -hmm. and see if our language should be written, mm -hmm. see what should be done. So, and I said, okay, well, what's so fast? And of course she goes, well, it's going without food and water, and being in the woods, and all of that. And I have to laugh, my going to, she didn't tell me all the other details. <laughs> I, I went there with my laptop. <laughs> While I'm there, we'll be there four days. I'm also get this done. I've got my book here. I want to read this book, yeah. etc., and all that. And I've got all the <laughs> supplies, right? Mm -hmm. I go there and I tell the elder, uh, where, where can I put my, um, where can I put my things? He goes, you're supposed to come here with nothing. <laughs> and uh, and I, our, uh, so I, I understood. So I took all my electronics behind me and stuff. And then I said, well, where's the bathroom? Because I had my toiletries, my hair dryer. Oh, and, no. and, all that, right? and of course, his going, uh, nope, the bathroom is in the woods right over there is where the guys will go. Over there is where the queen, women will go. And there's no flush. There's no shower. There's no this and stuff. So I realized, wow, this really is a sacrifice. So my my realization about my language, because that's what I fasted for, I told my ancestors, use me up. I am willing to go without food and water. I will open up my mind so you can tell me what I need to do to save my language. About the second day, and uh, there were challenges up to that day, you know, my first fast, because you get <coughs> so thirsty. You're not allowed to talk, and that's hard for someone like me who comes from a storytelling family, mm -hmm. and we talk all the time. And uh, when we were told you can't talk to anybody, it was like, how am I going to ask questions? And you know, just the usual doubts and everything. So that's where that man was, that man who did shake and tent ceremony. And all the women that I traveled with, they were going, we already offered him tobacco. He's going to give us uh, spirit names. And uh, why don't you come along? I said, nah, I don't want an Ojibwe name. I want a Maliseet name, a Western name. And I uh, said, well, you can translate it after. I said, you know, I already got what I fasted for. What happened to me in my second day is, as I'm feeling sorry for myself, it was in October, <coughs> right about this time, actually. And in uh, Ojibwe territory, it was quite cold. And I remember feeling sorry for myself because I was cold. And I'm going, what am I doing here? Oh, I could be back in New Brunswick, mm -hmm. in front of my you know, wood stove, etc., so all of that. And then I realized, I know this isn't what fasting is about, is to feel pity. So I remember there was a woman I was fasting with, and she couldn't walk. She was on a wheelchair. And her husband had to go and do offerings for her because they wouldn't let her use her wheelchair on the fasting road. So she had to stay in her tent, sitting down or laying down the whole time. And I'm going, I bet you she, wished she could be standing up. So I stood up for her, and when I stood up for her, I realized this is what fasting is about. I want to stand up for all the ones who can't stand up. I want to listen for all the ones who can't hear. I want to see for those ones who can't see and are so blinded by rage and, you know, and all of that. And I just had this epiphany of, wow, it's so beautiful to be able to do that. And I stood all that day and most of the night till the elder came and told me, you can, you can rest now because I saw your vision. Mm -hmm. And what my vision was, was for me to go back to my territory and thank everybody who learned the language, everybody who carried the language because the prayer that's, that, that's being said that actually in the Dark Eagle and Zibayi, they have this prayer that I brought back from that fast and it goes, no grandmothers and grandfathers. Thank you for the language. For the language you say for us. It's now our turn. To take care of it. For the ones not yet born. And so that's been shared around the world and it's in many different languages. And what that teaches me is, you know, sometimes you'll hear somebody and they'll say, I don't know my language because my grandmother didn't teach me. And it seemed like the grandmother was being blamed or the dad was being blamed because he married a non-Aboriginal woman. There was always seemed to be somebody to blame, the government, the church. So there was so much blame going around and I thought, let's stop blaming. 
Let's stop. Let's start celebrating. Let's start learning. Let's start doing this. And that's what that prayer means, is just to get away from that being a victim and let's rise up above it and start learning it one way or the other and sharing it. And so that man was, a, it, it was raining that day and he was in the hallway of this um, uh, home and there was a curtain hung up, we weren't allowed to see the man, but I could hear, sometimes I'd hear wind and I'd hear storms and I'd hear wolves and coyotes and eagle. I, I could hear so much noise and that's when I was thinking the Wizard of Oz. He's probably got this phonograph in <laughs> and he's making us believe that we're hearing all those things. But when it was my turn and I'm like, here's like here's here's my tobacco sir. You know, like I wasn't even respectful and I, I I'm ashamed now. But I've I've since, you know, <coughs> forgiven myself for that action. But when I asked for my spirit name, and he goes, you know you already have one. I said, no, I don't. And, and my grandmother's voice, who had passed away about 15 years before this man, before I met this man, my grandmother's voice, no way this man knew what my grandmother talked or spoke of. And my grandmother came to me, I gave you that name of Blossom was because you're one of the 13 roots start teaching our people and reminding them of the 13 moons. It's not the 12 moon cycle, it's a 28 day cycle. It has to do with grandmother teachings. It has to do with women's moon time. It has to do with young boys learning about women's moon time so that they will be gentle men and respectful. You know, and I see, so now the work that I do comes from that name. And so I do 13 moon teachings. When I turned 65, I made a promise to myself that I'm going to teach my own people because I teach, I have a teaching circuit. And so I thought, I'm going to teach my own people. So when I turned 65, every month I went to one of my communities and I did a teaching and did a public lecture like this. I recorded them and they will be put on line and whatever. You know, I did just something to leave behind. It's, most of it is done in the language. Most of it is, there's some of it done in English. And I talk about the different ceremonies that I do. Once I, once I regrouped from that name, I had to go back and I had to fast for that name, even though it was something my grandmother gave me. So I've been fasting since 1994, and I fast every year. I'm at the point now, I'm taking other people to fast, so I do children to teach them about puberty. So there wasn't too many that were doing males, so I'm taking young boys to fast for one day and give them a spirit name. I started with grandmothers because I didn't want grandmothers to tell their granddaughters, you should go fast before you when you first become a young woman. And they would say, well, did you? And of course, the grandma's going to have to say, no, I didn't. So they're going to say, well, how come you didn't go and fast for when you became a woman? So I started with grandmothers. And today, this, last, this, this past year, I did uh, three generations. It was a grandmother, her daughter, and the granddaughter. And they fasted together. Mm -hmm. The grandmother is, is terminally ill with cancer. I fasted for her because she wasn't in good health to be able to fast, so I said, don't worry, come back this time tomorrow, I'll fast for you, but I will seek your spirit name. And so she now has a spirit name that she just said, I'm ready, Creator can take me any day now because I'm ready, I burn my spirit name. And so those are the kind of things that we do. And, and the reason fasting is important is not just for indigenous peoples, because we have religions that fast, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's uh, when we fast for Lent, it's totally different. Like, you know, how we used to complain, first of all, we'll give up, you know, um, food we didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's not a real sacrifice. You really give up something like that. So so that's why my names are important. And, and that's, that's more me than Imelda is, you know. The pearly, part I accept because it has to do, you'll notice on the floor I have a fox. Fox is my clan, my grandmother was uh, married to Bernard. She was uh, a Moulton who lived in the uh, Moosehead Lake territory. And, and at that time there were no borders. 
So when her and my grandfather met, my grandfather was being displaced from Kakuna in Quebec on the St. Lawrence Seaway because they weren't wanting any Maliseets there because the ships were coming there and these people were, you know, disrupting the flow of progress. So my grandfather was displaced from there. They ended up in Tobik. And so all she said was, we have 13 children. Then they adopted one, and she says, nobody wants to take on the responsibility of carrying our clan name. Would you carry your grandfather's clan because he has no sisters left, no women in his, you know, in his family? So I accepted as a young girl, not knowing what I was <coughs> accepting about clan, and I realized now, oh my goodness, how important it is to know your clan. Balai I accept the clan name of my married name, you know, and I understand that for them, it's um, uh, porcupine clan. And so, and, and those are animals, both fox and porcupine have <coughs> gifts that to, to offer and to learn from. So accepting my names comes with that idea of the thing. Everything that you see here is something like, for example, the pipes. I just want to start with those. So here's two pipes. Uh, I have others, and, and this is the fasting. So. We, when I, we, we fasted for 13 years, every year, and how we did our fasting was we would go one day, the first, you know, year one, we, we fasted for one day. Year two, we fasted for two days. Year three, three days. Mm -hmm. Some people go four all at once and never go back. Mm -hmm. We learned so much doing it one day the first year, two days the following year, and what, in those four years, that we started off, there was 13 of us that we were going to do for four years. By the time we got to the four-year <coughs> one, there was only four of us. Mm -hmm. So it takes commitment. It takes a whole special, you know, worldview to be able to sacrifice, to be able to do that. Face fears, because for me, uh, my first night there, uh, I had an ancestor. Her name was Veronica Athman. You may have uh, seen her name. But she was a beautiful basket maker from King Square First Nation, Veronica Atwan. That first night, we weren't allowed to bring tents. We had to make our own lodge out of, you know, alders and then, uh, well, actually little birch trees, and then we just put a tarp over it just to keep us from the elements. And I heard this wolf, and, I'm, and I could feel the fear in the back of my neck, and I'm going, oh my goodness, what am I doing here? You know, and stuff. Uh, all that wolf's got to do is you know, and that's all gone. I don't care how many stones I put around it to protect me. And, uh, and, and I was afraid, and as I was shaking in my fear, I realized that's what being one with creation is, is facing your fears. So this elder's voice, well, I, when, I, when I died, I didn't learn how to say the rosary in my language. Would you say it for me? And I'd already learned it because we said rosary all the time. My grandmother made sure we said rosary. So as I'm saying the rosary my, my, in my language, I could feel the fear leaving me. And I'm going, wow, prayer is so powerful. So those are the kind of things that happens when, you, when you're not connected to a plug. You know what I mean? And think that all knowledge has to be plugged in. And, and that's what happened. That first day that I fasted, I faced my fear of that wolf. Second year, I didn't hear him, but it had rained a lot, and he left marks around my tent, and I didn't recognize wolf, you know, prince. And of course, the elder goes, oh, he had a visitor. I said, yeah, looks like a dog. No, 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 that's a wolf. I said, oh, last year I heard him, this year he's leaving marks. Third year, I'm looking for it, now what's he gonna do now? I didn't hear him, see him. Somebody else who was fast and said, wow, I saw this beautiful wolf, and I got really, that's my wolf. <laughs> and of course, the teacher said, humility, humility. <laughs> and so I got jealous because I thought, well, I thought the reason I'm fasting is, you know, the spirit is going to come to me and this wolf's going to teach me. On the fourth year, I was not hungry, I was not thirsty. My fourth day, my fourth year, I'm sitting by the sacred fire in my home territory, and I'm so elated and going. I, I think you know that feeling when you get your degree. You, you've accomplished it. You're done. Here's my diploma. That's how I felt my first four days, mm -hmm. you know. 
And I remember just, and everybody wanted to go back to bed. Well, I'm staying out here by the fire, and I'm, I'm offering my tobacco creator, thank you for teaching me how not to be hungry, how not to feel sorry for myself, and you know, and all of that, and the rain that I had to go through, and because we had to keep our sacred fires, and it was pouring rain, but and you're really tested, like, you know, but I made it, and when everybody went back to bed, I heard by the sacred, I was by myself by the sacred fire, and right around this, I, I assume my fourth day, and I'm, I'm, I'm having a vision, and I'm thinking it's my childhood pet dog. So I called him Dupkwan, which means dirt. He used to roll around in the dirt all the time, so she just called him dirt. <laughs> and I said Dupkwan, but when I looked in his eyes, it was wolf, this close. Mm -hmm. And I was, I cried because I thought, oh my God, you trust me enough to come that close to me, and I love you. Mm -hmm. And right as soon as I said that in my language, his partner came that close, and I'm bawling again. Mm -hmm. And the hard thing was, I couldn't tell anybody, because you're not allowed to talk, right? Not till we had council fire that night. Mm -hmm. Now, what ended up happening, my teacher had a hole in her tent. She got to use a tent because she'd been fasting a lot longer than we had. Mm -hmm. So she said, she said, oh my goodness, I saw it, I saw it. So when we were doing our council fire, she says, I know a blossom will have something to share. Mm -hmm. And then I shared it. And so there's mm -hmm. that one, you know, when we say, in my language, we say, Dan it doesn't mean good morning. It doesn't mean good afternoon. It doesn't mean good day. It literally means, how is your spirit today? And, and spirit is what I'm talking from. It's that idea. We are, our spirits, I'm depending on spirit to heal all physical. You know, that's why I do the work that I do. I work in mental health. I don't want my people to be over-medicated. I want them to find ways of dealing with a depression, a loss of a loved one, a broken relationship, a broken heart, a broken spirit. I want them to be able to do it through ceremony and not drown themselves in alcohol and drugs that they can't seem to find their way out of. And so that's what I do is I heal spirits. And so that's why I continue to do fasting for young people. I do fasting for women. I do what I call a solstice fast, a four day fast. Last year I had 19 people that fasted. And my youngest was 11, my oldest was 65. So it ranges. But every single one of them are going to be coming back again this year. You know, And I'm thinking, I'm 66, it's hard work. It's hard work, you have so much planning to do there. You have to make sure you have enough wood, you have to make sure a sweat lodge is built, you have to make sure everybody has enough medicine. And you're responsible for all of these people that are fasting at different times. I had a young boy, this, this our, our grandson, I, um, he took our grandson to fast with us and I warned him and I said, you might, it, this might, you might not be ready, you're only 11 years old. And he goes, nope. I had a dream, and in my dream, um, I was sitting by the fire with you, and I said, yeah, but you can't play Game Boy, you can't bring those things, you can't bring those, I'll let you write, but you can't do that, and it might get cold, it might get lonely, you might get hungry, you know, and stuff, and he goes, I can do it, and you know what, something happened all those years, I've been fast since 1994, and this past year, Something happened that never ever happened before. There was a baby doe that was crying all night long. Never heard that baby doe before. We heard wolves, we heard we see bear, we see moose, you know, camping through, uh, and the jackrabbits hopping through, the snakes. We, we see all that. But this year, when that baby doe was crying, it woke him up and he goes, No, Miss, I'm worried about that deer. And I says, Well, you know what? Let's go, let's go pray. Let's go offer. So I said it real loud. If you're in trouble, show yourself. Because this young boy is worried about you. Mm -hmm. And you know what? He never cried again the rest of the night. Mm -hmm. That morning, when he was receiving his spirit name, and uh, Giwak is his spirit name, and uh, because there was a strange cold that came that night, that it was in June. It shouldn't have been that cold. But it was so cold that I had to, I said, it must be the spirit of the ice giant. He walked, is the, what we say in our language. And so maybe that doe was trying to let us know that it's, it's unusually cold. So what ended up happening, that doe showed himself right after his spirit name. 
and I didn't see him. He goes, there he is, oh, he's okay. And he was able to leave the woods knowing that that doe, so that was his messenger, you know what I mean? And so if a young boy at 11 has an experience like that, I know it's gonna change his life. I know he's going to, you know, that, that's why it's so exciting to be able to do the, this kind of work and stuff, you know, is to be able to do that to heal. You know, like the elder woman who received the spirit name, and now she's saying, I'm ready because I burned my spirit name before I pass, you know. So that's what these um, things are. So um, uh, just uh, real quickly, so this pipe is what I call my, my community pipe. So I'm a pipe carrier for my community. You see the beaver on there. You see the double curve motifs on there. And you see, um, I, I, I want to share this with them. I'm going to let you touch this pipe because when you touch it, just give it a prayer for the next ceremony it goes into. And, and that prayer will come back to you. But on this one particular one, in the 1800s, Ganon had recorded um, a Malice petroglyph that was up in, um, in our territory. And because of the dams, it went underwater. This year, that petroglyph showed itself. It was underwater. It was underwater. The woman on the landowner was so excited. She goes, oh my goodness, there's picture. And she took a picture of it, sent it to St. Thomas, sent it to me. And I said, oh my goodness, this is a sign. Because we know when we do ceremony, when ancestors start showing us, mm -hmm. look at this. This is something we left behind for you back in the 15, 1600s. Mm -hmm. Time for you to pay attention. Time for you to do this. So I went and I did ceremony. And let me tell you, I'm even emotional thinking about the power of that stone when I saw it, knowing my ancestors left that behind. Mm -hmm. I put my, this blanket, I put it over the top of it, and I prayed, and I thanked it for showing itself, and I just said, ancestors, I know you're showing yourself, and what's on it is beaver. What's on it is this little picture here of a mandolin ceremony. And what was amazing, because we heard stories of our ancestors talking to what we call star people. I don't know if you ever heard that, don't worry, your ancestor is up in one of those stars shining down on you. We, we heard that all our life about star people. <coughs> and in this petroglyph, you could see the man doing, and I know it's a man, he's wearing a skirt. And people would say, why were men wearing skirts? But ceremonial skirts, when we sun dance, the men wear skirts. If it was a woman, the skirt would have been down to the ankle because we wouldn't have had mini skirts, you know, they mean back in the 1800s, right? So it was a man doing a ceremony. And when and where he's doing the ceremony, there's a spirit of bear in the sky and a spirit of deer on the other side. And in between are all these stars and they're like star like the star people going from the sky world to the earth world and you could see the passages. It was just amazing to see that. And it all just kind of justifies those oral traditions that we knew because that's why we're going to courts. The judges are saying, where is it written? Mm -hmm. We tried to say, we have it written in stone, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> but, but it's not in words. Mm -hmm. And so it's a big challenge to, mm -hmm. for those two worldviews to come together. One worldview says, oh no, it has to be in text. Another worldview is saying, no, but it was left in stones that's way back when, you know. And so, so that's why I want to share this pipe especially is because, and right below it is the beaver. And beaver is um, community minded. Beaver is the one, if anybody is upset by a beaver building on their terror, they'll tear it down. <coughs> beaver will just go right back up and build another one and another one and another one. There's persistence. And so that's how I feel, that's what, that's what this pipe, so that's why I go to communities. Let's not give up on our language. Let's not give up on our culture. Let's make sure our young people have a transition from even childhood to that young adult stage so that they'll be ready to be really good citizens as adults because they've been brought through ceremony. And when those are missing, so today one of my, just this past Sunday, I couldn't go home for turkey because I work this weekend, and I named uh, three babies. And I've named almost 150 babies, 
women, people who fasted in, let's say, maybe the past seven years. And so now I do it at Mother's Day every year, Woodstock First Nation, the whole community, all the babies that are born in the winter, their placentas are kept in a freezer, which Health Canada bought for the community, because it's a resurgence of their, their groundedness by being given a name in their language, you know? And it's not just eagle, it's which We had an eagle that was in the middle of the road today that we had to slow down and let him fly away. Otherwise, you know, he just wanted to show off. He was just sitting there on the way over. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, you know, like, okay, slow down, because we were rushing, we knew we were running late, but I know he put himself there to slow us down, you know, like, they slow down, you know, we are, we'll be careful. And as soon as we slowed down, he just, took its time and flew away. Gigantic, it was just beautiful to witness. Mm -hmm. So yes, we do have those messengers. And so uh, so I'm just gonna pass this around. You'll see some other, um, this one was carved, um, this one was put together by in this stone from Mount Carlton, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, which is a concern because you've heard in the news they wanna turn it into a resort of some sort, mm -hmm. you know, a snowmobile, something. And that's where our, our people used to go to make to get stone and stuff, you know. So the snow comes from that territory. And you see the crane, which is his mark, which is uh, Alan Silboy. And uh, and the reason that um, um, and the reason that I carry the uh, uh, community pipe and uh, in Mi'kmaq is because I did Sundance. Uh, after I finished uh, the 13 years, we decided to leave the mounds alone for a while to give them a rest because we were going there, you know, two times a year. And, and we were realizing that maybe uh, let's, let's give the mounds a rest, we're asking too much. So we, for four years, we left it alone. So while we were leaving them alone for four years, I decided to join Elsie Bookduk, uh, Big Cove, to join their sweat lodge. And I, I gave myself for four years to become a sun dancer, you know, and stuff, uh, to be able to stand up for the people, you know, to be able to dance for the people, to be able to sacrifice and continue to sacrifice. When I was done with that, I was just starting to learn star lodges, which have to do with wampum belts. And wampum belts are really important because there was another way that our people had left messages was on, um, on those belts, you know, what's on those belts. I discovered one, just recently at a retreat that I did for the Wabanaki women. And on it is a, um, a cross, and then it has four buildings. And according to, according to the uh, source, it said that it was a Maliseet wampum belt to show the church that God was accepted into their belief system. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I'm going to take that picture of that. I'm going to take it to the bishops of Canada. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask them, could we design a, a pall for over the caskets when we bury our people to have that one as opposed to the one that the church has. You know, the church has their regular one. But I want something uniquely ours. And, and, and I'm so lucky that I work with five priests that I do weddings with, funerals with, baptisms with, and they come into my sweat lodges too. It's not just me going to the church and doing drumming or anything. They, they, they come to my sweat lodge too. They come to those families that are comfortable of doing something in the church and the priest will then come to our community and do something in there. So we've got a good mm -hmm. you know, rapport where, where we're working together mm -hmm. and, and not separate. Just this past Friday, I honored missing and murdered Aboriginal women. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we did what we call the Red Shawl Campaign. And the Red Shawl Campaign, we had about 100 shawls hanging uh, at campus <coughs> done on display. And uh, they were, and then we didn't put them on hangers, we put them on um, birch trees, you know. And then um, and, uh, very beautiful display, which, which they're going to be displayed at Lieutenant Governor's House for the month of November and stuff, you know, as an awareness. We couldn't call it the Red Dress Campaign because the Red Dress in New Brunswick, especially Perrickton, is Heart and Stroke Foundation. So we didn't want to take away that momentum, so we did the Red Shawl to be specific to Aboriginal women. 
because mm -hmm. a shawl is important. A shawl, a young woman, all those little girls and women that I named, they earn shawls. Mm -hmm. And the shawl is to be a protector, to, to be ready, you know. Uh, you know, to, you, you ever see a teepee? You see on a teepee the, the, the cone shape. We wear hats mm -hmm. that are cone shaped. And I, I, I would have brought mine and stuff, but I usually just wear it for ceremony. But it's a ceremonial hat that's shaped like a cone. And when I was wearing it in church on Friday, Father, Father Bill goes on. And uh, I haven't seen you wear that before as well, special occasion. This is the steeple of our church because it means we were thinking beyond the physical and we're thinking spiritually, something that's above us, which is just like the church. That's why the steeples are there. It's supposedly sending a message to God, right? In the same way, we're sending a message to our Creator and asking for that. You know, I, my, my mind is open to that spirituality, mm -hmm. and so uh, and so we 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 um, did a ceremony together on that. And uh, the other, you know, that pipe that's going around, it was called peace pipe, but we never called it peace pipe. The only reason it was called peace pipe, it was brought to times of trouble, you know, or times of negotiations, signing of treaties. And so our ancestors who were pipe carriers, you know, made sure that before I agree to anything, I have to pray first. I have to make sure that everybody is in the spiritual view first, as opposed to just going ahead and sign them to get it out of the way. Because that's not what a, an agreement is. An agreement has to not just be physical, it has to be spiritual. It has to be socially correct. It has to be responsible for everybody and not be, not have any underlying, you know, uh, things. And, and so, uh, so we didn't call it peace pipe, but it came to be called peace pipe because it was always brought up when there were times of disagreements and, and, and war. So what ended up happening is um, we, when we were signing our treatise, the elders would have said, my ancestors would have said, we don't sign our name on a piece of paper just to show that we're telling the truth. We come from an oral tradition. And therefore, we carry truth as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers flow. And so I carry that symbolism on my drum. I have regalia with it on my moccasins. You'll see, uh, yeah, not that side, but this <laughs> side. <laughs> but you'll see the sun, the uh, tree, and the river. The reason I added the tree is because I believe that those of us who are grounded to our own culture, we're going to leave behind for that next generation something very positive, because we have to leave something behind for those generations not to <coughs> And so I'm working hard to leave my ceremonies my traditions, my language, especially my language. And that's why I get criticized because I have non-Aboriginal people in my language classes. But I reward them at the end because I thank them for carrying the language. I says, look, we're helping you save English. Can you help us save Madison? Can you help us save me now? You know, just, just carry a few of our words. And that way they'll never die that will do that. And if you could do that for us, we'll continue to respect using English as well. So there's there's a compromise. So I open my classes up to anybody who wants to take it and I give them, you know, like Rita Jo was a, a residential school survivor, a Mi'kmaq woman, and she wrote that, she wrote that uh, poem, You Took My Talk. And she talked about what it was like for her in a residential school not to use her language. And she said, you took my talk. Now I think like you, I talk like you, I create like you, but now I operate in my language so you can think like me and talk like me and create like me. That's how important it is. And so that's what the tree symbolizes to me. In my language, we call it uh, the uh, standing one, the one who stands against all storms, the one who, you know, um, uh, stays rooted, you know, reminds us of our roots. And so it's very uh, symbolic. So that's what the pipe was for, was for that spiritual essence of an agreement. And so uh, so it is being used. Uh, there are people that may disagree because they'll say this isn't our government and therefore a pipe shouldn't be at the <coughs> legislative assembly. But I believe it does. Because if, if, if the premier 
and the 15 First Nation chiefs in our territories and the federal government and the provincial government are going to be signing agreements. There better be something spiritual about it. Mm -hmm. And so so I take the pipe. And I told my, my elder Charles Solomon, used to say, they don't want you using your pipe, you can use mine. You know? So, and he passed a few years ago. I, I he left on his pipe. I carry his pipe as well. It's like that comes in other ceremonies. So that's what the pipe is for. It's male and female balance. <coughs> the bowl of the pipe is considered the female. In our worldview, creator isn't male nor female. Creator is both. Mm -hmm. Because when, um, when, we're, when we create something, <coughs> we're in creation in that way. And so the left side is considered where the heart is, is our, our female, our, the side where our mother is, our grandmother's before us. The right side is considered our father's and our grandfather's side. It's called the protector side and the nurturing side. So we're supposed to carry both. Yes, I'm physically female, but I have to know that I also carry the DNA of my father, my <coughs> grandfather's before me. So I have to respect where I come from on my male side and on my female side. And so that's what we do. So the pipe teaches me that. So when I do ceremony, I will hold the female part of the pipe and I'll go to all the directions above and below and within and honor all that is male and all who are female rather and do the same thing for male. The little part that joins <coughs> the pipe, you know, this little part that sticks out, that's called the child. So after the male and the female come together, it's only whole when there's a child to pass it on. And so that's considered, you know what I mean, that's considered the child. And so on this pipe, it has the sun, the tree, you know, the river, and the uh, grass. So that, uh, so I use this for, uh, uh, you know, um, when I'm asked to come and do a, um, a circle, you know, a healing circle, or when there's a marriage, because for me, Vows are beautiful, but I think the most important was I will love you and honor you and walk with you as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers grow. A little bit more forever than you know, uh, <laughs> until we go our separate ways. <laughs> so, so, so I use that on, uh, on, on that one. So that's what the pipe is, and so it teaches me about being in balance, you know. Um, and I know. Um, you know, sweet grass is seven generation thinking. You know, we are, when we say we belong to the earth, we really do. We, um, we, we belong to the earth because everything that's upon the earth was supposed to know how to take care of it. But I'm worried because our, our medicines are less, it's getting, we're having to buy sweet grass now. There was a time.